Okay, this lecture is going to be called How to Raise IQ and Become a Genius. And what it's basically about is that to try to really develop one's academic abilities and intellectual abilities, you really have to go against uh, custom. In modern society, it's sort of cool to be stupid. And a lot, no one will say it's cool to be stupid, but you ask most adults, you know, what books have you read lately? They'll go, oh, I've been busy the entire year. Oh, I've been busy. They won't read a single book the whole year. Well, if you don't read a book all year, that means you're a functional illiterate. So... Um, and to be smart, it's different than being an athlete. I was an athlete when I was younger and very good before I got injured. And everybody likes you when you're a good athlete. But when a person pursues academics, people just think you're weird. They don't, very few people are interested in it. Um, this is a good example. This is a book called The Curse of a High IQ. And the guy talks about all the problems of being intelligent in a society that does not value intelligence and academic achievement. So, the purpose of this video is how does one ramp up their personal philosophy and mentality so they can be highly successful academically at a place like Harvard or Stanford and in competitive medical, academic, and intellectual environments. So that's why I'm making this because it's rare. I've written a whole bunch of books on the subject. Straight A at Stanford, on to Harvard, it's this book here. Uh, this was a fun book to write, How to Raise IQ and Become a Genius. After I'd raised my own kids and had had a lot of time, I read all the educational books. Okay, so we'll get to that stuff later. Um, this picture here is my father, uh, one of my uncles and my other uncle, and that really helped me a lot to develop an intellectual sense when I was young. Um, my father's brothers would come over to talk about books. They're all from Ireland, off the boat, fuzzy foreigners. They didn't know anything about the United States. Um, but they would argue about books. And so as a young guy, I had it built into my brain. That's what a man does. He reads books and argues about them. And that was very good for me. And if you look at other cultures that are really smart, you're going to see that that's a characteristic thing. To read books, stories, whatever it might be, and discuss them. And this uncle in particular was very nasty. He was always calling my father and me stupid and uh, insulting us. And paradoxically, that ended up being a good thing in a weird way. Because he, he would read a book, finish it on Saturday, come over to our house on Sunday, and then both tell us that we're stupid dummies. And it bothered me. You know, I really looked up to my father, and he was always insulting my father, insulting me. He's, ah, you're as stupid as your father, and stuff like that. So I would always read books, you know, try to have a stack of books, go to the bookstore with my dad, read a bunch of books, so that when he would come over, I would question him about books. And it was um, sort of this competitive intellectual thing, which was good for me. It got me to read a lot. Um, this is a picture of me as a sophomore in high school as a wrestler, and I was pretty intense about physical competition, and alternating between reading, studying, and training for a sport was good. And wrestling, I think, was a good sport at that time. Um, this is just a picture, it's kind of summarizing my life. I think I was in college coming home for the summer. Basically, wrestling and studying was the vast majority of my time in my life. Um, that's at Stanford. I was recruited over there as an athlete. The big name schools wouldn't recruit me anymore like Iowa because I got an injury. They didn't want to risk wasting scholarship money on me. Um, that's where I really learned about loneliness. And man, I hated being lonely coming from the Chicago suburbs going out to Stanford. But I learned how to keep busy. And luckily, I liked reading and studying. And I think most people that develop well intellectually, they go through a phase of loneliness where they just learn to spend a lot of time reading and studying, and that can actually be good for you in a lot of ways. You learn how to entertain yourself. Okay, these are my wrestling coaches in college, and they probably had more influence on me than any other coaches or teachers ever in my life. Mark Schultz was NCAA three-time champ. Here he is defeating Ed Bannock in the NCAA Finals. He was world and Olympic champion. He was so hyper intense and mentally tough. That And then here's his brother, Dave Schultz, congratulating Mark after winning NCAAs. Dave was also uh, NCAA champion, a world and Olympic champion. And I learned more from these guys than any Stanford professor. Dave in particular, when he was a kid, he was kind of fat and dyslexic. And then he started becoming fascinated by wrestling and became like the best high school wrestler ever in the history of the country and one of the best wrestlers ever. Kind of like Bruce Lee is to martial arts, that's what he is to wrestling. And when we had our first practice as a Stanford wrestling team, we ran sprints and Dave was slow. Uh, we went to the weight room and lifted weights and he was weak. And he was kind of out of shape and fat. And I'm like, how did this guy become you know, national champ? He's fat, weak, and slow. But what I learned is 
He is so obsessive about technique. He was so great at technique. Again, like Bruce Lee is to martial arts, that is like he could read your mind. Anything you could try to do on a wrestling mat, he would see it coming, anticipate it, and crush whatever you did. Um, so what I really admired about him was I was very afraid I was going to flunk out of college, and I noticed how he, you know, you ask a regular college coach, he'll teach you, you know, two, three ways to finish a single leg from the feet. Do a dump, run the pipe, or switch off to a double leg. It's about it, okay? Dave will tell you through 20, 30 nuanced ways or more on how to finish a single leg from the feet. So the point is, by learning everything a person could possibly learn about technique, he exponentially made himself better. And that's what I did to try to uh, do well academically was I said, well, gee, I don't have the athletic ability to be as great as these guys, and I wish I'd tried harder at wrestling. I could have done better. After my injury, I was a little bit down on myself in that. But I did everything that he did for wrestling. I did that for academics. And that's how I, I ended up getting the student athlete of the year at Stanford and A-pluses in the most difficult classes. And it was from sort of applying the Dave Schultz mentality to uh, to academics. And I also learned a lot from Mark Schultz. My first two years, I was scared of these guys because they're pretty brutal. I mean, they were named the Bruise Brothers. They had an extra referee that would follow them around in international Olympic competitions because they were so brutal, their opponents. I mean, it's kind of frightening. I had to wrestle Dave Schultz in practice, and he crushed me so bad it wasn't even funny. Um, and so, but I learned from them. So I was scared to talk to them my first two years, but then I was kind of desperate. You know, I wasn't progressing as well as I had hoped to. And as soon as I started hanging around Mark Schultz and he started just telling me stories, this is what you got to do. This is what happened when we wrestled the Russians. This is how you got to think. This is how I defeated this guy at Oklahoma. To, okay, and so as soon as I started hanging out with those guys, I got way better at wrestling. And then I set the school record for wins in a season and, and you know, won Student Athlete of the Year Award is because their mentality started to wear off of me. So what I'm basically saying is if you want to be good at something, find people who are already good at it and hang around with them. Read their books, watch their videos, study them, read their biography, whatever their age, you know, if they're living or not living or near or far. If you can meet them in person, go meet them because excellence transfers from one person to another just by being around them. You just start to absorb their mentality. It's their mentality that makes them so great. There's a component of athletic ability, but the mentality is very much... Uh, transferable. Okay, now here was uh, Dave Schultz winning the Olympics. Um, and like I said, incrementalism, trying to improve every single thing that you can possibly improve. Uh, that's what makes you better. There's not one big thing. You can't just instantaneously, you know, make a wish and have everything get better. You have to keep on improving everything that can be improved and be obsessive about it. This is my roommate training partner. And so I had a pretty rough life as a wrestler. I'm wrestling national champions and All-Americans and world champs in practice. I'm getting my butt kicked on a pretty frequent basis. And so that really motivated me, though, like through the Alfred Adler inferiority complex. I no longer was a great athlete. I was a good athlete, but not a great athlete. And I wanted to try to compensate for that by becoming something else, a great scholar. And so I was highly motivated. Some people tell me, oh, you know, I can't get motivated to study. I'd wake up out of bed. I would study all day long till I go to sleep. I mean, I take a little study breaks here and there, but what I'm trying to say is motivation was not a problem. I was hyper motivated, and that's good. Wanting to be the best you can be and being motivated are important. So if you're not feeling that way and you really want academics to be your thing, um, then you have to examine your philosophy of life, your worldview, your goals for yourself, because you have to get yourself psyched up because it takes a lot of effort and energy. One of the biggest differences between people who are real successful is the real successful ones are obsessively focused and they've got the energy to work on it all day long. Um, okay. And you got to value meritocracy. That has to be put in there from the beginning. Um, Psychology of performance, I had a weird insight that, you know, when you're a great athlete, everybody likes you, wants to be your friend. Men and women both like you. Everybody likes athletes, okay? But it was weird. Becoming a scholar, first of all, almost no one cares. And then there are the few people who care. If you get really good, lots of people hate you. And now people think that's a weird thing to say. What do you mean people hate smart people? Oh, they really do. And if you think about it, it's obvious. Do you think the dairy industry likes Dr. John McDougall? They hate his guts. They lose money because of him, okay? Do you think the coronary artery stent makers like Dr. Esselstyn, who teaches people how to prevent coronary artery disease with a diet instead of somebody getting stented, they hate his guts, okay? When McDougall was a clinical physician 
at his main hospital there in California, he got zero referrals from the other doctors. Zero, okay? You'd be expecting a bunch every day. Zero, year after year. When Esselstyn tried to start a diet program at his hospital, they wouldn't let him have a clinic until he finally, you know, did some things where they sort of were forced to let him, okay? Um, and I can just tell you, I'm probably the best Hispanic uh, student that ever attended my university for medical school, University of Illinois. Probably the best Hispanic medical student in the whole United States. Would, they wouldn't let me come back to teach the students. They were sort of like offended by my, my approaches. And why? Because I don't sit there saying, oh, you know, we need more money for this or that. No, I will teach the students how to be the best they can be and really help them a lot. And so nobody wants to bring in a Maverick expert because if the Maverick succeeds, They'll say, oh, well, how come you guys didn't do it? And they're embarrassed about that. And if he fails or does something offensive or something, then they go, why'd you bring this jerk in? So they feel like there's no way to win. So I was shocked by that. I'm like, all the students having trouble at my alma mater, and I offered to teach them for free because it's just kind of fun for me. I was bored. I said, I'll go over. I'll give you guys a lecture. Oh, no, they don't want me giving a lecture because my opinions about academics are so different than conventional opinions. I actually think personality is the most important thing in developing intellect. You have to have this belief. A typical person just studies to get a grade so they can get a job and make some money. That just leads to average performance. Everybody's like that. You have to have this idea, I want to be the best. I want to become the expert of this field. I want to make new discoveries. When you start thinking that way, all of a sudden, your brain is energized to really master the subject. It's the difference between taking Spanish and doing grammar questions to try to get a decent grade, which is what almost everybody does, and no one learned Spanish. I know people who majored in Spanish in college, and they still can't speak Spanish. On the other hand, if you approach Spanish language not as just a task to get a grade by learning grammar questions, but to really communicate, you start reading books in Spanish, having friends in Spanish, communicating with other people in Spanish, you'll learn the language. You know, Go live there for a while and talk to people. You'll learn the language. And that's the same thing about like studying biology. Study biology because you really want to understand biology. Medicine, biochemistry, because you want to speak it as a language. You want to learn it. You want to feel it. You want to make discoveries in the field. You'll get great at it. And I noticed, too, I read the book Sorrow's a Young Verther. It's the book by uh, Wolfgang von Goethe about a guy who was in love with this girl. And he was so obsessed about her. You know, back then there were no cell phones. So he kept writing to his friend, Wilhelm. Oh, I love her. The way she talks, the way she walks, the way she interacts with her siblings, the way she dresses. Oh, everything about her is so wonderful. And the point I'm saying is if he could fall in love with biology or biochemistry as much as he was with Charlotte, he would have been the best biology, biochemistry student around. Okay, one sec, sorry. Hey, hey, shut up. Keep, keep going, Keep quiet. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, that's, that's what it comes down to. Genius has changed things, and therefore they offend people who, the powerful people, don't want things to change. They're making money. They're enjoying their control over situations. The last thing they want is some genius to come along and really see it and really change things. That pisses them off. Okay, Ralph Waldo Emerson, American scholar, very good about learning to trust your own intellect. You have to trust your own intellect. Um, and you have to think for yourself, which means you're going to have to go against convention a lot, and people get offended by that. Um, uh, I got in trouble plenty of times when I was in my uh, residency and stuff because I would just do whatever I thought was best. And by that I mean, like the instructor would tell me when I rotated through pediatrics, oh, I want you to speak about you know, some diaphragmatic hernia. I'm like, uh, no, I'm going to talk about meningitis because I wanted to do all the spinal taps and I wanted to do something difficult. And so like, he gave me a bad grade for that. I didn't care, but I, that kind of situation happens all the time. Um, I traded all my time at the rich hospital to go to the poor hospital because I could function at a higher level and do a lot more procedures and get good at the procedures. I wanted that. That's a typical thing. Uh, Maximal Achievement by Brian Tracy, really good. Helps you to get into the right psychological frame of mind for excellent achievement. I highly recommend that. If somebody wants to be a top achiever in sports or academics, Maximal Achievement by Brian Tracy. He gets you psyched up. Um, Maxwell Maltz is really good. He was a plastic surgeon, and he noticed some of his patients have great outcomes, some of them lousy outcomes, when he did the exact same operation, and it was their psychology, a person who's highly motivated and energized. I need to recover from the surgery fast to get home, take care of my kids, or because i got to go do achieve something. That person would get better right away. A person who was sort of uh, mopey and didn't really have an intense focus, they'd often you know, sit around in bed, oh, I'm in pain, I need some medicine for my pain. Then the pain meds make them sleepy, they don't walk, they get a DVT in their leg, pulmonary embolism, or they're constipated, then they, they get one problem after another. Pneumonias, 
All right, your self-image shapes what you can do. So you want to have high aspirations. It's better to be a little bit stuck up and overconfident than it is to be a scared to do anything. Um, I talked about Dabrowski's theory of personality disintegration and reintegration oh, previously, not in this lecture. So Dabrowski was this Polish psychiatrist who developed a theory of how a person develops. And what he said is, you go through difficult times where you're sad and disappointed and frustrated, and that's the disintegration phase where you lose a part of your personality, whatever it might be. Like for me, I lost my wrestling uh, excellence when I got injured repeatedly. Um, and then I sort of like put that energy into becoming a student scientist doctor. And um, instead of just being sad about not being a great athlete anymore, I was so happy to at least have something I could do to, to put my energy into becoming a great scholar that it energized me. And Alfred Adler talks about that too, the inferiority complex. So all day long I go to wrestling practice and world champions and national champions are beating the shit out of me. Um, and <laughs> it was not a lot of fun, but I knew that I was improving, so that was good. And it made me want to achieve. And, you know, we, I'd go out with these guys and, you know, I'm always the low man on the totem pole in the wrestling world compared to all these, you know, champion guys. And so I wanted to, you know, be really good at something. So I was so motivated to study. It's incredible how motivated I was. Um, John Taylor Gatto is his famous teacher. He's written a lot of books about academics, and he emphasizes individualism. If you ever want to be great, you have to be individual. To be not an individualistic person, that just means like everybody else, and you're not going to be great. You're just going to be average. Okay, all this personality stuff, development, you know, I, I've also talked to students. If I talk to a B student in college, he's going to tell me, why are you talking about that? You're being weird. That's not how it is. Some people are just smart. Versus you put me in a conversation with somebody who's crushing everything, like a 99% student, they're going to go, oh, that's good. I get it. That's good. Because it's a level of where the student's at in their maturity. The more mature a student gets and the more they've been exposed to intense academic competition, the more they understand every little thing I'm saying, yeah, it's correct. What the Schultz brothers are to wrestling, I'm like that to academics. And I can tell you, all this personal philosophy and nuanced stuff, it's what energizes you to handle difficult academic challenges. So exercise makes you smarter. The brain is made for movement. Why do animals have brains? Because animals move. What's the purpose of the brain? To walk down a path in a jungle, a forest, or a prairie and survive. All right. Um, a sea squirt during this juvenile phase, it has, it's like a tadpole. It swims around and it has a brain. When it's an adult, the sea squirt attaches to a rock, becomes a filter feeder. Its brain reabsorbs. You don't need a brain if you don't move around. So you keep it moving. Having some type of sport or extracurricular activity you really like is important. And it should be a, something good, you know, maybe being a musician, maybe uh, being an athlete. Uh, neuroplasticity is just the ability of the nervous system to change. Neurogenesis is the formation of new neurons, especially in the hippocampus, the memory center. Also, a couple other areas, subventricular zone, substantia nigra, too, as well. So Parkinson's patients can actually make new neurons. It's one thing they should strive to do to try to maintain their neurologic function. BDNF is brain-derived neurotropic growth factor. It's increased when a person exercises, also when they are in the process of trying to learn something. Mitochondrial biogenesis means the formation of new mitochondria. When you exercise, you also make new mitochondria in your brain. So that's good to know. So that's what I mean by exercise makes you smarter. Also, when you start studying a lot, like you're in grad school, you get more study endurance. You build up the ability to study for more prolonged amounts of time. Your brain also stores glycogen, you know, in relatively small amounts compared to the liver and, and the skeletal muscles. But it stores glycogen that does increase your academic endurance when you're in the habit of studying a lot and exercising a lot. Because the brain has to work with your muscles whenever you're moving. So... The brain angiogenesis is the formation of new good vessels to provide more collateral circulation to the area. Synaptogenesis is the formation of new synapses. Those are the connections between neurons across which neurotransmitter is released for communication between neurons. Frank Longo, MD, PhD, neurologist at Stanford, has a good lecture, Learning and Memory, How It Works. But the best part of his lecture, is almost like a two-hour lecture, is at one hour and 51. Uh, right at that time, you see the neurons. They stain them with this green fluorescent stain. You can see the neurons trying to connect with each other. And you get that idea of a hunger for knowledge. I mean, you want to be trying to learn something every day. And if I don't feel like I've learned something all day, I'm antsy. I'm not happy. I just, and that's good. You want the neurons to be constantly seeking learning. So why do neurons seek connection? Because the new information has to be connected into the network of the old information in order for you to learn it, to retain it. And the brain does hunger for knowledge. 
And the persons who have studied smart people have noticed a smart person is always seeking out learning opportunities. So if you want to be smart, you have to learn how to do that too. That's why you should read all these biographies of smart people. Ask your role model for advice because you'll learn a lot from them. So, okay, here's a couple study books. This is the book I use for my diagnostic radiology written boards. I don't know if you can see that. So only about the top 15% of people could get into radiology at the time I went into it, real comp competitive in the 1990s. I, I got a perfect score. I was done like about an hour, 10 minutes on a four and a half hour test for a diagnostic radiology written board. This is how I did it. There was no internet really in those days. So it's uh, this is an outline format, condensed notes. Everything's in an outline format. Everything's cross-indexed with the journals, with the other study books. So it was always in one place I could go to it. So I didn't have to search around. Most students end up with a whole bunch of different books, and they try to buy books at the last minute. It's too late. They run out of time. Right from the first day, you should be thinking that I'm going to have to take some standardized tests and whatever it is, two years, three years, four years, and prepare for it. And you should seek learning. It's going to be socially awkward. I mean, most of the residents in my program were AOAs from the top 10% of their class. I can tell you, though, I was the only one who took notes in conference. I was the only first-year resident that would sit in the front row with the attendings. I could care less. I was there to learn. I'm not going to waste any time. I learned the, the material so fast that for we had half our conferences were run by attendings. I always go to those because the attendings know a lot. The other half of the conferences were run by the, the residents themselves teaching other residents. And by my first year and a half, I hated those conferences because they were so slow, such baby talk. Uh, there's a certain amount of core material you're supposed to learn by the end of your third year. I, I probably learned in about a year and a half. I just refused to go to those conferences, and I was pulled aside, talked with the residency director, how come you don't attend conference? And I said, because it's a waste of time. And I said, you're not being a team player. I said, I'm not going to go to some kindergarten BS conference. And so um, they didn't even let me be chief resident because of that. And I had a perfect score on boards, and I did all the procedures. I could function like almost like an attending at the poor hospitals. Uh, but that's the kind of thing that I meant. They weren't happy. They were happy I got the high scores, made the program look good, but they weren't happy that I wouldn't go to some stupid conference and they wouldn't let me make it better. That's sort of like a typical thing I run into. And always walk around when you're reading because, uh, you, you, I mean, don't always walk when you're reading, but I'm saying reading and walking is a good thing. You come home, the quick way to exercise, I'll walk in circles around while I read. Um, you become more alert when you're walking. You can pay attention to a book better sometimes than you could when you're just seated. Okay, this is just showing mnemonics. I wrote hundreds of mnemonics to memorize stuff. I mean, school's basically like a memory contest. And so you just have to be good at memorizing stuff, which means learning all the study skills, learn all the memory systems, learn all the different types of mnemonics, learn how to make the most of flashcards. Now, in this other book here, I'll show it to you. So this, this video is not for everybody. Somebody just wants to get a, a B in, in an easy high school or college class. This is not for you. This is for people who want to perform at the absolute top they're capable of academically. Uh, so there's a tab index. These are illustrated condensed notes. It's like this picture right here. And um, so basically for my neuroradiology boards, I would just tape all the pictures into, the same, into, the, into one book from all the journal articles, from all the textbooks, I would just cut them out from other books and stick them all in one spot because I wanted all the information in one spot that I had to know. You know, like the anatomy of the lymph node system, the anatomy of all these complex areas in the head and the neck. Um, and so, and I just absolutely crushed the test. And it was, these systems are what enables me to do it because a lot of doctors have real high IQs. I talk to a lot of smart doctors every day and a lot of them understand stuff really fast. But it's pretty rare to find somebody that has real high-level intellectual curiosity and wants to read a lot. They're not the same thing. There's lots of bright people that really don't have much intellectual curiosity. They're able to learn things fast, and that's great. But they don't really care that much about learning. They want to make money. They want to you know, do whatever they do. Uh, so intellectual, high-level intellectual curiosity is actually a rare thing, and it's socially a very awkward thing. Um... Here's an example of what I call the magic bathroom. I mean, basically, I was always figuring out, how can I find more time to read? So basically, I heard, you know, Mozart wrote an article. I think it only fitting to write while shitting. So I just put a table in the bathroom uh, for number two. I'm right in front of the toilet there. Number one, when you're voiding, I heard the Monty Python skit, every sperm is sacred. And so I thought every void is sacred. So I'm always going to read a paperback. This is a Mark Schultz book right here, Foxcatcher. It's a great book. Every high school wrestler should read that book. It's how you get mentally tough to compete at the college level and the international level. Um, and so I'll always read in there, and I'll get a lot of reading done. I read at least one book in 
completion every week, and I'll often read significantly more than that just from going in and out of the bathroom. You go in the bathroom so much. Um, then I would take pictures all over the walls of um, person either, you know, mostly academic stuff I had to memorize. You look at it. You use visual memory is the strongest part of your memory. And then also persons who I was inspired by at any given time, and that would motivate me too. So I was trying to keep myself in that mindset of whatever I thought was good and best at that time um, so I can stay high energy. you got to maintain a high level of energy to get all this work done, and you have to simplify your life so you're not wasting time with anything. You should not be wasting any time with things like TV or anything else. Um, So here's just another picture of the magic bathroom from a different angle. There's the table. You can move it with your foot. Um, there's a the paperback to read on there. I had a whole other bunch of books I would sometimes read, you know, when I was going through them. Um, here when I was studying for neuroradiology boards, I put all these things up here. And so, of course, you know, I had a separate bathroom from the wife. You know, no way would the wife put up with this. And I'm always in some far corner, but that's okay because I'm constantly having to run up and down stairs and that's great. I get a lot of exercise just from uh, taking a study break to go to the bathroom. So that ended up working out well. The wife was all proud. She gets control of the good marital bathroom. Fine. I got plenty of exercise over here. And, of course, I have to be relegated to the corner because she doesn't ever want a guest to see <laughs> what I've done to the bathroom. Um, anyways, that's the magic bathroom, and it really helped me to learn a ton of stuff over the years. This is a, a picture of what are called Leitner boxes, L-E-I-T-N-E-R. And basically, this is a form of spaced interval repetition systems. Quite often, what the typical average student does is they keep looking at their notes, look at their highlights, and they spend way too much time going over stuff they already know. The point of spaced interval repetition systems is that easy material is rapidly advanced from box to box. You look at the flashcard, do you know it? If you know it instantly, it goes to the next box. If it's difficult, you have to hesitate for a moment. It's not you know, internal, deep in your subconscious, then you keep it in the first box again, you have to look at it again. So the point being is that difficult material is going to take a long time before it makes it to the completion box. Easy material rapidly gets there, so you spend more time on the difficult stuff. This book here, Straight A at Stanford and on to Harvard, that's a book I wrote mostly about my experience at transforming from an athlete into a scholar, um, which was difficult for me. I never took an honors class even. I, my parents were both fuzzy foreigners from other countries. They didn't know anything about the United States, anything about the academic um, situation here and I was totally afraid I was going to flunk out but what I found out was those conversations with my dad and my uncles when I was young that type of mentality really was a good mentality for going into a competitive academic place and then the other stuff you know wanting to be like the Schultz brothers um, I, I actually found by my second year I felt like I had a big advantage over the other kids at Stanford um, so anyways that's a book about that transformation Oh, here's another thing. When I got injured my senior year of high school, I couldn't wrestle for a while, so I ran on the cross-country team. And it was a good experience for me. These cross-country team guys, they were the best students in the whole school. They had the highest SAT scores, the best academic grades and everything. They were really nice guys. And I think that um, the same mentality of perseverance and self-discipline that goes into being a good student and studying a lot, it goes into being a cross-country runner. You know, you're going to run a three-mile race. You've got to push yourself to do that at a fast pace. Um, and so also I'd hang around with these guys. I'm like, gosh, these guys all scored higher than I did on the SAT, ACT test. I go, why can't I be like that? And I started to, I retook all those tests. I bought the books at home and I restudied from them and I kept doing better and better and better. And you, you know, they tell you, oh, it's a fixed intellectual quantity, your IQ or your academic ability. You can't improve it. It's not true. You can improve tremendously on those SAT, ACT tests by studying for them. So you, because you get it faster at everything. They put too many questions and they say, well, it's a sign of intellectual skill to get stuff done fast. So the more you study, the faster you go. So they're really an academic level you're at test, not an academic ability test. And if you need to recognize that, so you put the effort into studying. Also, Ruth Heydrich, you know, the uh, PhD lady with incredible recovery from breast cancer, she said that she's never seen a runner get Alzheimer's. It makes you smarter. You get neurogenesis, producing new neurons when you run. So also, you don't get any head trauma. Uh, so you want to run in a nice area where they, there's good air, fresh air. Like a lot of people, I see them, you know, walking and, and running next to a busy street. Well, then you're inhaling all the pollution from the car. So that's kind of counterproductive.
Uh, okay, standardized tests. What I liked about a standardized test is, you know, most people come from some, you know, unknown place, Ponong, so to speak, and it gives you a chance to compete with people from the famous places. Otherwise, the guy from the less famous place is always going to be considered inferior academically to the guy from the famous place. But it turns out most of the best guys, they don't come from the famous place. They come from other places. They might make some a detour, some stopping time at the famous place, but that's not really where they come from. Naperville High School in Illinois, one of the gym teachers had the good idea to make kids uh, run or go on a treadmill before their math class, and they improved dramatically. Um, it energized them to do better in math and other academic classes. Naperville High School became famous for that, and there was actually a high school in Pennsylvania that repeated it, got the same results. Physical fitness goes well with um, academic achievement. Uh, standardized tests are really a memory and a speed competition, so you practice doing them, you get better at them. Um, and also a good attitude to have to say, why not me? Why can't I be one of the best students in the class? Why can't I write an excellent essay? Why can't I do this? And if you think that way, you push yourself to achieve. If you say to yourself, well, I'm doing okay, I got an A minus, well, then fine. But if you, if you want to keep on being the best you can be, it's good to think of your academic abilities like being an athlete. I want to try to get better and better and better and better. Move to a, a better, higher level if I can. That's good. And you got to study for standardized tests. Uh, my senior year of college at Stanford, I was really kind of cocky. I sort of felt like I'm the best pre-med student at Stanford, certainly one of them, if not the best. And so why should I have to study for this stupid MCAT test? This is BS, you know. Why should I bother with it? Because all the guys in my fraternity, the athlete fraternity, Mark Schultz said, you got to move to an athlete fraternity to become a better wrestler. And I think that was true because I wanted to be around athletes. They have a different mentality. But they all asked me to be in their study group, and I was like, no way. I was like, I would be like the tutor for all those guys. So I didn't want to be in the study group, and I, did, I actually didn't study for the MCAT. I thought it was kind of beneath me. And um, I'm the student athlete here at Stanford. Why should I study for some stupid MCAT? Well, the, the significance of it is it was kind of embarrassing. They all did better than me. It was like humiliating. And um, that was a good lesson for me. Uh, and I learned all this study for standardized tests because how you study is how you do it's not a question of what you know already it's how much you prepare for the actual test um this is just a picture here's my med school picture after med school you know i had gotten high score in my class 99 percentile like incredibly high board scores in biochemistry maybe the highest score in the united states if not the highest, I don't know what the other kids got, but I know where I was percentage-wise that it was a good chance it was a high score in the United States, probably was. Um, Medical Student's Guide to Top Board Scores. I wrote this book. The dean of the med school wrote the foreword for it. Um, this is like the second edition, um, all about how do you crush the board's exam in medical school. And then you have to seek out learning. Like here I am, I'm at this course where we're, I know everybody hates animal experience. I was a young guy. We're learning how to, all these complex surgeries on uh, but I, I, I don't do that stuff anymore. But when I started out, I was an imaging guided surgeon, and I would go to all these training courses to learn really advanced techniques. Um, this guy is actually a world famous image, imaging guided surgeon there. And then you want to write something in your field. Oh, this is great. Oh, okay, so first of all, I got fat in my mid 30s after I did a neuroradiology fellowship. I tried to do two fellowships simultaneously, diagnostic neuroradiology and interventional neuroradiology, imaging guided endovascular neurosurgery. Uh, but I saw that regular neurosurgery was taking it over. So after my first six months, I no longer did that. But I also had a baby at home with the wife. And, so, and I, I wrote this textbook during my fellowship, neuroradiology fellowship. I wrote a textbook about just body interventional. And we had neurointerventional as well. It's this textbook right here. You can see that's me, the first author. And so I got fat. I got up to 220 pounds, which is fat for me. I'm only about 5'9". And um, I couldn't lose weight for a couple of years. And then my sister-in-law just laughed at me. She's like, if you know so much about nutrition, Mr. Doctor, because I was a little bit stuck up. She's like, why are you so fat? And that's the point where I decided to devote myself to studying nutrition. And um, it was also the case that, you know, my father had had some coronary artery disease problems. My mom had cancer. And, you know, I just referred them to specialists. And I didn't know much. Um, and, you know... I sort of, as I got older, said, gee, I wish I had really studied those diseases better. Maybe I could have helped my parents more. Uh, my dad came well through his cabbage coronary artery bypass graft, but he had a stroke four years later, which I think might have been because his lemon to the LAD, left internal mammary artery, 
was stapled down to his left anterior descending artery. That might have caused a dissection in his vertebral artery when he was shoveling snow, thrown it over his shoulder so it sticks like the mechanism of a clay shovel fracture. And anyways, I didn't know enough to force him to go vegan, and I wish I had. Maybe that would have prevented that stroke. And my mom, I just sent her to a cancer doctor who did a good job, and it was nice, and she outlived her expected prognosis of two years. She lived 12 years, but I might have been able to keep her alive for 30 years if I had put her on a low-fat vegan diet and done all the other things that I subsequently learned about. So anyways, I was sort of pissed off that I felt like I'd let my parents down. I was mad at myself, and I said, I'm going to become an expert in all this stuff. And I've been amazed at how powerful the low-fat, low-sodium vegan diet is. It's the most powerful thing in all of medicine. It's incredibly powerful to help people. Okay, you got to get your sleep, and you're smartest in the morning. The reason is at night the brain cleans itself. That's the glymphatic system whereby the blood-brain barrier permeability opens up and increases, and then cerebral spinal fluid rinses over the neurons, and neurons throw out their waste products like, you know, English Victorians throwing out their chamber pots, their waste products, and the CSF rinses it away. So you're smartest in the morning, and it makes sense, too. At night after you eat a dinner, you got a full belly, go to sleep. In the morning, you wake up. When does an animal need to be smartest? When it's hungry. So you get that energizing boost of cortisol, and your real alert ghrelin is activating your hippocampus to be more alert. And so an animal needs to be smart when it's hungry. So you want to do your most difficult intellectual work. First thing when you wake up, don't eat breakfast, don't exercise. If you're serious about intellectual work, study the first moment you wake up. If you have to write a complex book chapter, do it first thing when you wake up. Trust me, that's as smart as you're ever going to get. You want to cherish that time. Time management, don't waste any time. Take out a piece of paper, 30-minute increments, write down every all you're going to spend all your time for your day and figure out how to be most efficient with it. There are certain things. In general, you don't multitask because that distracts you. But if you can do three different things, if you use different parts of your brain, for example, the brain can only do one cognitive task at a time. But a visceral task, like to digest food, you can do that simultaneously while you read, while you walk, while you listen to an audio book. Uh, so you can exercise while you eat and learn simultaneously. In a car, always have an audiobook. Don't be listening to music. Anybody can listen to music. You know, every stupid person has got loud music in their car. Listen to an audiobook, okay? The radio is always stupid. So you should have an audiobook of some form because you'll read tons of books that way. Um, so just from in the bathroom, I always read at least one complete book and usually significantly more than that every week. I always um, have a book in the car. And so if I drive about, I don't know, 10 hours a week at least, that's usually about completion of one book because uh, actually I drive a little more than that. Um, and then I come home, and as soon as I come home, I'll walk around in a circle for a while reading. So it's, that's how I get through so many books. Um, what does it take to be a doctor? you got to be a hard worker. you got to have determination. You have to say to yourself, Getting into, the hardest thing is getting into med school. It can be really hard to get into med school. And some people get screwed over and don't get in. Some people who are really kind of stupid do get in. Uh, but it's tough to get into med school. And that's the hardest thing. But once you're in med school, it's not that hard from all the way out. Probably only takes an IQ of about 110 to get through med school. Um, and no doctor is lazy because doctors have to work a lot. The system basically says, look, you're lucky to be a doctor. You pay pretty well. Shut up and do your work, okay? All medical systems are based on this hierarchical do your work and shut up. Get your productivity units for the day. All medical systems are based on that. So any doctor that's not a hard worker gets booted out of that system pretty fast. So um, the best doctors, the ones who really figure out complex cases and stuff, they're always trying to learn every day because you never stay the same. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. So you have to make a determined effort to keep getting better every day in order to keep on improving. Um, and also, you know, the system rewards a conformist who just goes by standard guidelines. But if you always go by standard guidelines, you never really get good. Because standard guidelines, they're designed for patients who are unconscious, cognitively impaired, intoxicated. If you want to develop nuance and ability to apply, you know, improved options to every subset of patients, you have to spend a lot of time studying and thinking and analyzing. And so you have to be an individualist. But to be an individualist, you risk potentially pissing somebody off who wants you to be a conformist, if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, so that's one of the dilemmas. Okay, this is about raising your kid to be smart. Even before you get pregnant, 
you want to be improving your diet and your health because the woman's breast milk is going to be dependent on what she eats. If she's eating a bunch of processed junk food, she's going to have all kinds of toxins in her breast milk that go right to the kid. You all want to plan your time so you got time to uh, nurse the kid because the formulas, a lot of them are pretty toxic. And you have to analyze everything in the pregnancy. What I mean by that is people say, oh, take your prenatal vitamins. Well, are you sure you should? Make sure they're good prenatal vitamins. I've known a bunch of doctors who refused to take prenatal vitamins because they said they thought they were no good. So check if they're the good ones. Maybe analyze them. If you can chemically test them, what's actually in them? Not just somebody says they're good because they're always going to be told this is the standard. Standard doesn't mean optimal. You want optimal. And, you know, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But I'm saying analyze that sort of thing. Um, breastfeeding. Uh, you want to breastfeed the kid as long as possible. You look at a lot of these so-called primitive populations. They actually be got better care of their babies than the modern civilization. The mother will breastfeed those kids two, three, four years, okay? Um, a lot of these formulas are really bad. They're, they're, they think they're junk food for kids. It can cause brain damage. Um have good, test your water coming into your house. Have a water filter, a whole house uh, carbon filter, a kitchen reverse osmosis filter. That's important. A lot of toxic stuff in water. Uh, maybe move to a place with well water. A lot of municipal water filtration actually stinks. You know, if you have good well water, that's better than city water in most situations. Don't be thinking your city is doing a good job. Most municipal water filtration, I've read quite a bit about it. They go, oh, it's too expensive to remove that, too expensive to remove that, too expensive to remove that. There's tons of stuff in the water you don't want. Lots of estrogenic chemicals, lots of other chemicals that are harmful. You don't want that. i got separate lectures on water filtration. It's a big subject, but trust me, it's a big deal. You're drinking healthy water, especially like for a newborn baby, their brain to develop. You want healthy water for the kid. Talk to the kid a lot. Kids are smarter, more verbally sophisticated if the parents talk to them a lot. Read to the child, and the parents should be role models. You don't want to, you want the parents to be role models because if the parents aren't role models, their role model is going to be some celebrity who's usually going to be an airhead jerk. Okay, um, the parents should have the kids see them reading and that they enjoy reading because love of reading is a huge, perhaps the most important thing, one of the most important things that leads to cognitive development. Um, it's good to play classical music adagios for the kid because. They're more likely to develop perfect pitch hearing if they hear that when they're in a baby, their first year of life, and that can help them to become a more successful musician. I think piano is the best instrument for a kid to play. Teach them drawing. Drawing is a great hobby. You can, you can use it all their life. I like drawing, piano, learning languages. Those are things a person can use all their life. Sports are a lot of fun, but you know it's harder to play a sport your whole life. That's one of the downsides of sports. But I mean, don't worry, I like sports, um, as long as there's no head trauma. Um, feed the kid a healthy as possible diet. Try not to get divorced. There's a lot of glamorization of divorce in society. But you know what? It hurts kids. I've seen a bunch of kids get all messed up. I've known kids that they've kind of become crazy after the parents get divorced, commit suicide, become drug addicts, all kinds of bad things I've seen when the parents get divorced. Uh, having the parents together helps kids a lot. Um, if possible, homeschool your kids. Public schools stink. Even in the good neighborhoods, the public schools stink. Um, if you can send your kid to a private school, if you can afford that, send them to a private school. If you don't, you know, obviously most people can't homeschool, but private school is way better than a public school. Anything's better than a public school. Public school is designed to make children conformist and stupid. Um, Ayn Rand wrote a great essay called Compra Chicos about the psychology of putting a kid in preschool. Preschool is overrated. You know, the your kids get a click gang mentality. It's not good. And people say, oh, well, you learn social skills and all. It's easy to learn social skills. Every stupid person has pretty good social skills by their mid-20s. It's not like a difficult thing to learn. Don't worry too much about social skills. Worry about intellectual development. That's hard to develop. Literacy, enjoyment of education, those are hard to develop. Basically, first year of high school, for example, by making kids read uh, like Julius Caesar and a whole bunch of other stuff they're just not ready for. It makes children hate reading. And that's why most people, most persons in this country, never read a single book again when they're adults their entire life. Uh, so you can't really be well-informed and well-educated if you don't read. Uh, that's where most of the information is. You can learn a lot from the Internet, but it's usually incomplete. You get a lecture here, a lecture there. You know, a book that takes 12 hours to read is going to have a lot more information in it than a 15-minute video. Videos are good. You can learn a lot of great stuff from a video, but... You really want to supplement that with reading for most subjects. And people also say, well, the child learns social skills going to a friend's house. You know what? 
I've raised children, okay? They go to the friend's house. The older brother tells them all kinds of dirty words and gets them to play video games. And then the kids don't want to study, okay? It's, it's, friends and is, are overrated uh, when kids are young. Some things to read. Oh, the study skills book. I don't know. I got it around December. Super Memory Super Student is good by Harry Lorraine. He's a memory systems expert. You want to learn memory tricks. You have to memorize stuff for school. If you want to be a good student, you got to be good at memorizing stuff. Uh, here's my book, Straight A at Stanford on to Harvard. Um, here's a book I had a lot of fun writing, How to Raise IQ and Become a Genius. And I go through, I read everything. I read hundreds of books on academics, on learning, on because I was real obsessed with trying to become the best possible student I could be. And I was afraid, like when I was in medical school, am I going to get into the best residency, be able to pursue the career of my choice? Because in, in med school, you have to do well on your boards to have your first choice of residency options. Um, so I, I pretty much read everything you could read on how do you improve your memory, how do you optimize cognitive function, um, how to win friends and influence people by Carnegie. It's a good social skills, you know, if you're having a little trouble with that. And I was a little socially awkward from being so lonely and isolated all those years in college. Uh, Charisma by Cabane, that's a great book for, again, for a person who's a little awkward in that stuff. Uh, body language books and videos can be helpful for a lot of people. Um, I've noticed men tend to communicate more verbally. Women communicate verbally, yeah, just as well, but there's a lot more nuance in their facial expressions than in a guy. That's why I think like in a conversation on a telephone, a woman always kind of has an advantage on the man. I feel like if I talk to a guy, I know exactly what he's saying. There's nothing ambiguous at all. But with a woman, a lot of times I don't quite know what she's really thinking unless I can look at her face and see her expressions and stuff. So she automatically knows when I talk to a woman on the phone exactly what I'm thinking and saying versus I only kind of know what she's thinking or saying because I've had misunderstandings where I can't understand a woman on the phone. Um, role models for your hobby. Whatever your hobby is, study the people who you admire in it that are great and learn from them. You learn probably the best books to read in general tend to be biographies. Oh, these are just some examples. One of my kids uh, taught him, you know, he was building a birdhouse. Uh, the kids, these are all paintings my kids drew when they were young. And those are good hobbies for them. Because a lot of kids nowadays, they go to school and they get some stupid homework assignment. Memorize this list of words. What good is that? You know they're going to forget it after the quiz. It's worthless. Um, so what I'm saying is drawing is a skill. You carry it with you for life. It teaches you how to observe things, how to see things in a better way. Building stuff, you learn how to build stuff. You learn how to work with tools. That's useful. When I was a kid, you go and, you know, you work on a car. You know, I knew older guys when I was young, and they could take your engine apart and re-put it back together. That's a great skill. You know, that gives you also freedom. You can make your car work, and you can fix it yourself. You save money, and if there's a problem with it, you just fix it yourself, and you know what's wrong. Versus nowadays, if you get one of these totally electronic things, you take it to the dealer and hope the dealer is going to give you a good deal and not rip you off. I don't know. I think the old way was better. Okay, here's just some exercise things. Uh, at my house, we had this tennis wall, and I built uh, or I had it installed. I helped build it. Put these uh, giant net behind it so the tennis balls wouldn't go in the neighbor's yard. This is a great place to exercise and hit tennis balls. I actually, when I was fat, I moved to this house specifically because I knew I could exercise a lot there. And everything was going great for a while. Here's the pool. We used to swim in the pool. I learned all about pool chemistry. I used to shoot baskets at the other hoop. We had a whole full court there of baskets, basketball stuff. Had a, a jungle gym for the kids to play on. Had animal enclosures for when friends and family to bring their dogs over. And uh, it was great. I loved that old house. Oh, I, I think I missed one of the pictures here. Oh, here's just one picture. Um, this is my basement. You can see there's a wrestling mat on the floor. My nephew's in um, finishing up high school now. I wrestle with him on the weekend. So I'm 58. I still wrestle. Um, I'm lifting weights here, doing squats. Uh, these are, see this bar with the handles in front? That's called a safety squat bar, so it's easy on the shoulders. I got all kinds of little minor old injury problems, but I'm still squatting. I do high repetition squats, like a high intensity interval training program thing. And um, I only lift weights once a week, but what I'm trying to say is I'm up there lifting weights. So um, you got to maintain fitness. Use it or lose it. Uh, high rep squats, it's just like standing up from a chair. 
you'll be pretty strong pushing up squats, doing a high repetition set. Uh, like my most recent highest thing was like 115 pounds for 105 reps. And so that's a lot of endurance there. Strength like a farm boy, you know, throwing 50 pound bales of hay all day. So the point is, if you try to push yourself, you'll keep a high level of fitness. If you don't, you'll get old, fat, and weak. Okay, now here's the thing that my kid said to me one day when I'm coming home uh, from work. He said, you know, Dad, you're a bad parent. I said, why do you say that to me? And he says, because you don't help me with basketball. He says, other dads help their kids. You and Mom just work all the time. You're a bad parent. And I felt bad, you know, and the kid was on a basketball team. He was like sixth or seventh man on the team, and he wasn't hardly getting to play in the games, and he felt that he had talent, but he couldn't develop it because no one helped him, and he had nowhere to practice. So I looked at our living room. We were just using it for storage, and there was no plan to use that living room for anything else at that time. So I said, you know what, this could be a good basketball court. we got a high ceiling, a wooden floor. I had my carpenter buddy come over. We, we put wood boards across the inside of the window so they wouldn't break. And I put installed a basketball court in the living room, moved out all the furniture, and my kid got really good. He would practice for hours. He became like a star of his team. Uh, the younger kids would ride tricycles and bicycles in there. Everybody was happy except my wife. My wife went apeshit bananas about it. Um, <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. We ended up moving to another house because of that. It was like too much for her. The house was not meant to be a gymnasium. <laughs> Why not? Uh, things to seek. Mentors. Got to find mentors in your field. Seek them out because as soon as you do, you'll learn from them and get better. If you can't meet them in person, read their books or watch their videos, whatever it is. Whatever it takes, get around people who are good at what you want to get good at because they've already found the path to excellence. Uh, try to have at least one smart friend that you can have an intellectual conversation with. Um, don't blame your teachers. You can expect that many of your teachers are going to suck. Most teachers are not very good teachers. You have to teach yourself. Whatever subject it is, if you have a good teacher who you, who you like and who helps you and is knowledgeable, consider yourself very lucky. I remember I was all excited about my pathology teacher when I was in med school. and I told my father about him. He's like, yes, you're going to remember that guy the rest of your life. I go, oh, come on, Dad. Why do you say that? I'll have lots of great teachers. Dad's like, no. <laughs> a great teacher is a rare thing. Consider yourself lucky. Thank the teacher. Okay? And I did. Um, and he was great. Uh, um, optimal diet. Yeah, we talked about that plenty. There's lots of, you know, good websites. Find the one that's good to teach you what you need to know. Buy the courses if you have to. Go seek out the training. Go to the place. Um, Kind of talked about this already. Read the biographies of some of the great men and women, whatever, in your field because they'll inspire you and they'll keep you guided because all around you in society, there's going to be a lot of peer pressure to be just like a typical dummy, sending text messages all day, going to get drunk on the weekends, and just sort of dissipating all your time and energy. No, pick one or two things. It's hard to do three things. Pick one or two things you really like and try to get good at them. In the long run, that'll bring you more satisfaction. And then read about Anybody great or interesting related to what you do or what you care about, and that'll help you. Oh, this was just one funny thing from this book here, How to Raise IQ, was Phyllis is a lady who was dating Alexander the Great, and she had heard that Aristotle told Alexander the Great to break up with her. So she tricked, Alex she tricked Aristotle and made a chump out of him. So that's a picture of... Alexander the Great watching Aristotle get chumped. The point being is even the smartest person in the world Aristotle was at that time could be easily made into a chump by a woman. <laughs> it's kind of a good story. It's a famous uh, work of art. Okay. Things to avoid. Uh, you don't want head trauma. Everybody knows there's head trauma in football and boxing, but a lot of people are not aware of soccer is a real common cause of head trauma. I've known people had to drop out of uh, college because of uh, a cognitive uh, decline from soccer, heading the ball. It's like volunteering to get punched in the face. Heading the ball is stupid. They should change the rule. And if they don't change the rule, don't let your kid play soccer. Uh, wrestling was okay, and I still love wrestling, but you know, you don't want to be doing any, and it's okay to do some of those martial arts if they're like wrestling, but you don't want anything where you're getting punched in the head because you're going to get cognitive impairment from that. Um, air pollution, avoid anything with air pollution, avoid anything with noise pollution. Uh, try not to get your kid a cell phone or at least as late as possible 
Cell, once kids get cell phones, their IQ drops like about 10 points. They put it in their front pocket. They microwave their balls. They put it in their breast pocket and microwave their breasts. Increased incidence of rectal cancer. They're sticking it in their back pocket. I don't know if that's related or not, but it's not a good idea. You don't even need a TV in your house. TV is just a waste of time. It's it's designed to to cater to people that aren't that bright when they come home from work and they just want to sit there like a slug. You don't want to be watching TV. It's a waste of your time. If you're interested in high-level achievement, you don't want to be watching TV. Um, try to have some smart people to hang around with. Um, you got to hang around people that energize you to achieve whatever it is that you want to achieve. Don't get a job that hurts you. Like, for example, some people say, oh, in the summertime I made a little money as a painter. No, don't be a painter. Painter is inhaling all these toxic chemicals. You don't want to be doing that. If you want to make your goal to be as good as you can be academically, then don't do anything that hurts your cognitive performance. That means stay away from, you know, where you're smelling paint. Bad thing. Okay, no cigarettes, alcohol, MJ, that's all bad for your brain. No, I recommend no caffeine. All the stuff about coffee being good for you is not true. We talked about that in another lecture. Uh, okay, we talked about all, stay away from all this other stuff that, that harms cognitive function. Oh, uh, here's just one picture. This is my family. So my dad was from Ireland. My mother was from Puerto Rico. My mom's family real smart, smarter than my dad's family. Lots of, the, half of these adults in this picture are all doctors. And what I'm trying to say is having a support of a family makes you a lot better off. So be grateful for whatever family you have. Do what you can to try to keep the family together because you have to sort of help each other. When you go out in the real world, it's all this competition. In a family, it should be mutual support. And uh, that'll help you. And you got to make it a priority in your life. Otherwise, families all fall apart from divorces and then nobody sees each other again and then you lose the benefit of your family. So anyways, um, I think that's it. I hope that was helpful to you. And if you're really serious, like want to be first in your class in college or med school, this is the type of book to read. So anyways, I hope that's helpful.